Hello, can okay. you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Shall I guess? Shall I start? Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Ruben Veresen. I'm a postdoc um, in Ashwin Vishwanath's group uh, at Harvard. And I also want to thank um, uh, th uh, thank the um, organizers for bringing, all, for bringing us all together and giving me the opportunity to present some of our recent work. Um, so in this workshop, we're discussing a lot of exciting and exotic phase of matter. But of course, a natural and an important question is, how do we actually realize them in practice? Right? And how do we make them an experimental effect? Um, it's a challenging question, right? Because many of these models tend to have multi-spin interactions, whereas in experiment, we usually have to make two, make two body interactions. Um, and to ask this question in a kind of more constructive way, you can ask, okay, what, what, what tools do we actually have at our disposal? Right? And there's a conventional route of solid state systems, but also more recently, a very promising route is that of engineer, engineered quantum systems, where you can really you know, coherently control individual atoms and where you, at least in principle, perfectly understand um, the interaction terms between the uh, different constituents. And um, in particular, a year ago when we started working on this project, one, one platform that, that really um, drew our attention was that of Rydberg atom arrays, uh, at least for two different reasons. Firstly, it's taken achieve quite huge system sizes. So you say roughly three years ago, they hit the milestone of, of having 50 atoms. And last year they could do more than 200 atoms, which also means you can now start, start exploring two dimensional physics and not just one dimensional physics as it has it been explored before. And the second reason um, is that these Rydberg atoms tend to have very strong interactions, which make them a good candidate for realizing these exotic phases that we all uh, like to think about. And um, let me also, before I continue, uh, emphasize that we're by no means the first to start asking the question of how to use Rydberg atoms for realizing the exotic physics, particularly at the bottom of the slide, you can see some of, some of the important works in this direction. Okay, so what are these Rydberg atoms that I keep mentioning? Um, so essentially what one does, using uh, lasers, one manages to trap particular atoms, for example, rubidium atoms, but the details don't matter that much. So that's shown here schematically. And for, for all practical purposes, you can treat each trapped atom as a, an effective two-level system. So either, in a, either is it, it's in its ground state, as depicted on the right, or by shining uh, on it with a very particular laser, you can excite it to a particular Rydberg state. So this gives us an effective two-level system for every atom. So schematically, you can uh, write it down like this. And I mentioned already that they have, tend to have strong interactions. And this is actually quite simple to think about. Um, the main interaction is that if you have two excited Rydberg atoms close to each other, that actually experiences a strong energetic penalty. So uh, at a first approximation, you can actually disregard such states, which is called the Rydberg blockade. So it actually can give uh, rise to quite a lot of interesting physics, which has already been explored in detail in one dimension recently. Um, for example, here I'm showing a one-dimensional uh, array of Rydberg atoms. So here's a Rydberg atom in its ground state, here in the excited state. And for example, here we see two Rydberg atoms close to each other that are both excited. And by the Rydberg blockade, we can essentially um, forbid such states. And the interesting thing um, is that it makes the effective Hilbert space uh, a constraint, um, which uh, is, is kind of an exotic property. Um, and also the effective model, the simplest mo possible model you can write down which also is a good description for these Rydberg atoms, as, as, as far as I know, it's first written down in this, in this paper cited here. So you essentially just have a diagonal term, which uh, you know, favors either empty or filled states. And then you have a simple off diagonal term, which is the sigma x operator, but it's been projected down into the constrained Hilbert space. So that's what this p does, and that's why it's commonly referred to as the pxp model. And in 1D, for example, this was studied in the context of quantum scars. And so one thing we were, were wondering about is can we use this PXP model to realize some exotic physics in higher dimensions? So that's uh, what the uh, focus of the rest of my talk is about. So even though I think right, this it'll, it'll is a more general mechanism to explore, in this talk I will focus on the simplest possible case, which is Z2 topological order. And I'll first explain how to get that from a Rydberg blockade. Secondly, aside from just realizing a phase, you also want to know how to detect it. Right? For example, especially in conventional solid state systems, this is a very tricky thing because in solid state systems, you usually can just probe local observables. But in these 
engineered quantum systems, you can even measure non-local observables, which actually gives us access to something called the Freitenhagen Marku order parameter, as I'll discuss. And then lastly, I'll even show some experimental data on the system. So as I already discussed, um, this Rydberg blockade so this Rydberg blockade can actually allow you to construct um, a constrained Hilbert space. And one very interesting constrained Hilbert space to explore is that of a Dimer model, right? So those of you not familiar with a Dimer model, the Hilbert space essentially consists of all possible Dimer coverings, say in this case on the Kagome lattice, for instance. And the reason this is interesting has been explored, um, for example, in the works cited at the bottom of, of, of this slide, um, so what we understand now about these Dimer models is that they're a very natural encoding of a Z2 gauge theory. Um, the way this works is that you see that a Dimer state has a property that every vertex of the lattice is touched by one and exactly one timer, which means that if you measure the parity of Dimers around any vertex, you get that it's minus one, which you can actually interpret as a sort of Gauss law. And in fact, instead of the usual electric field, this tends to have a mod two property, which you can also easily understand. If you remove a dimer, such as, so this is our starting state and remove a dimer. Now we have two vertices where the parity has flipped. And as a side note, uh, one uses the word monomer for a, a vertex where it has no dimer touching it. So you see that a local move can create two charges. That's kind of the mod two property. Um, but then if you imagine that your wave function in the dimer space has a lot of quantum fluctuations, such that uh, without a large energy penalty, you can actually flip dimers around, then you can actually pull them apart. So these two, two monomers could be pulled apart. And um, so this shows that with strong quantum fluctuations, you could potentially get deconfinement of your Z2 gauge theory, which is of course a defining property of topological order. Um, and in particular, uh, this, the, this paper by Miskwitch, Serban and Pasquier, Man managed, to, managed to write down an exactly solvable dimer model in the Kagome lattice, which exactly manages to realize this phase of matter. Okay, so our, our goal or our question was, okay, can we realize such a dimer model using Rydberg ethics? Um, and indeed you can. So if we place Rydberg atoms on the links of the Kagome lattice, uh, side note, links of the Kagome lattice form a lattice called the Ruby lattice. But anyway, so these dots denote where you would actually put the physical atoms. And if you then tune your blockade radius to this distance, so this means that um, any two atoms which are in this distance cannot both be excited because of this blockade physics that I mentioned before, then you see that you can naturally get the dimer constraint, right? Because for example, if this bond is occupied, then you forbid that any of the touching bonds can be occupied, which is exactly this dimer constraint. Just to illustrate this, this is for example, uh, one possible uh, configuration that is consistent with this blockade. And if you just draw it differently, right? if you draw ovals, now you see that it looks like a dimer model. There's actually one caveat though. Indeed, the blockade means that no two dimers can touch, but it doesn't a priori tell you that every vertex has to be touched by one dimer, i.e. .e., we're not necessarily at maximal filling. So it act actually, we don't get a dimer model, we get a dimer monomer model. But um, remember, this is our Hamiltonian, this kind of PXP with a diagonal term, and we can actually tu uh, tune the um, density of monomers, so we can get quite close to a dimer limit. Um, and uh, let me also mention that there's other works that explore the possibility of getting dimer models using Rydberg atoms, as you can see at the bottom of this slide. Now, okay, so this gets an effective uh, dimer model, but it's actually only half of the story, if you remember, right? That naturally encodes a Z2 gauge theory, but to get a deconfined phase, you need a lot of quantum fluctuations. And our Hamiltonian effectively only has one off diagonal term, which is just this PXP term. And physically, right, what this does is removes or adds a dimer. In other words, you can think of this as creating E-anion pairs, which will indeed effectively induce uh, resonances between different dimer states. And the question is then, is this enough to stabilize uh, a deconfined phase? So for that, to answer that question, we actually need numerics. It's not a solvable model. So we did some um, density matrix normalization group calculations on some cylinder geometries. And of course, in the interest of time, I'll spare you all the details and I'll jump straight to the, re the result. Okay, so what did we end up concluding? So we have this one dimensional phase diagram where we tune um, this, this uh, chemical potential, if you wish. Now, if delta is very small, then it turns out that the state is adiabatically connected to an empty product state where all atoms are in the ground state. Uh, oppositely, if delta is very large, we get very close to a 
pure dimer model, but it turns out that in that case, it's not in the topological phase and we get this kind of classical like order DBS pattern as shown here with a quite large unit cell. But we we're quite happy to see that there's an intermediate phase between the two, which is still close enough um, to a dimer limit to, ha to have dimer like properties, but have strong enough resonances um, to uh, stabilize the spin liquid. And just here, for example, here I'm showing a density plot and you, know, can, you can directly see the difference between the VPS and this kind of more homogeneous resonating uh, dimer state. Um, and we've, I, we've confirmed that this actually is a spin liquid through a variety of probes. So again, I don't have time to go into this at all. Maybe let me, let me maybe just quickly mention what we checked. For example, topological entanglement entropy seems to work out to log two, as you would expect. Uh, we could observe the topological ground state degeneracy on the cylinder. Moreover, we were even able to extract part of the SNT matrices, whose results were also consistent with um, Z2 topological order. So I, I won't discuss any of those things. Instead, I want to focus on um, a nice feature, which is that we can even identify the topological string operators in our model. Um, for those of you familiar with the Tori code model, it's similar to how we have the diagonal and off diagonal string operators in that model. And uh, the reason that this is, is useful is that you could also measure this in an experiment to use this to diagnose that, you're, that you have a, a Z2 topological ordered phase of matter. Okay, so let me then briefly discuss what are these string operators that, I, that I'm mentioning. Um, so there's basically two types of string operators, a diagonal one and an off diagonal one. They're both actually conceptually very simple. So the diagonal one is just um, the obvious thing where you measure the number of, or the parity of dimers along a string. The reason this is natural is remember if you actually do the, if you actually measure parity along a, around a single vertex, sorry, that's always minus one in a dimer state. Um, so essentially for those of you who like the high energy um, nomenclature, um, this uh, corresponds to the um, Tuft line uh, of your Z2 gauge theory. Um, with M anyone sitting at its endpoint. And there's also a dual uh, order uh, string, which uh, kind of anti commutes with this parity string, which ends up shuffling dimers around. So it's defined in this particular way, way, but you don't need to worry too much about the definition. The main property is that for any closed loop, it'll map one dimer configuration to another. But if you have it with an open string, it ends up creating monomers or Z2 gauge charges at the endpoints, which is again similar to what we're used to from Toria code, that the um, string operators have E or M anions living at their endpoints. So now knowing these string operators in a dimer model is, is very useful. For instance, you can use it to label topologically degenerate ground states, which we also did in our theory paper. But what I want to focus on instead is that you can use them as a very useful order parameter to diagnose uh, your topological order, both in numerics and uh, in principle in experiment. And the conceptual picture is very simple, right? By construction, these string, or, these string operators, they create anions at their endpoints. And if you're in a deconfined phase, that means that um, you're at least at the end of the string, you're changing a kind of a topological charge, which means that the resulting state should be orthogonal to the ground state, right? Unless you're in a confined or trivial Higgs phase, it should be orthogonal. So you can measure, you can use the, uh, you can check, does this string have long range order? If yes, you're in a trivial phase. If no, that's a very unique fingerprint of a non-trivial topological ordered phase of matter. But of course, there's an important caveat is that unless you're at a fine-tuned fixed, you know, RG fixed point limit, these strings are not exact symmetries. Okay, they're just adiabatically connected to the correct operators. So which means that these string operators for long enough strings will always decay to zero because you get some trivial contribution um, from the string a length. Now, in the 80s, Freden, Hagen, and Marku realized that you can uh, very elegantly factor out this trivial contribution by properly normalizing the string operator in this way, as shown here pictorially. And so this was originally developed in the context of lattice gauge theory. And there's this very nice paper in um, 2011 by Gregor, Hughes, Misner, and Sondi, where they actually kind of rediscovered this concept in a condensed matter context. And they also convincingly show that it's useful even for emergent gauge theories. Right, where you don't have an exact uh, Gauss law. And indeed, um, basically measuring this, order this, this particular order parameter, um, uh, it's predicted to be really tending to zero in a deconfined phase and, and tends to a non-zero value otherwise. So it's a very useful probe. So of course, we check this in our numerics. Um, so just I want to guide your attention to this, this plot 
uh, here in this panel. And we're plotting this Friedenhagen Marku FM string order for both different types of strings. And we see that the spin liquid indeed decays to zero, whereas in the neighboring non topological phases, it has a non zero value. Just for, for reference, I also show the corresponding uh, clo closed loops, and those indeed give a non zero response in the topological phase, as expected. So, in the last minute, let me quickly show you some experimental results uh, where we can actually probe these string orders. So on the left, I'm actually showing you a concrete readout of the experiments, the actual experimental configuration. And we see that we get an effective dimer state in this particular regime parameter space. Um, and uh, by taking many different snapshots, you can easily calculate diagonal observables. And uh, this way, we can observe that we see strong uh, measurements for these loop observables, which confirm that in this regime of parameter space, we get an effective dimer model. And then by calculating these open string FM order parameters, we see that we get a very small result as would be expected for a deconfined phase. And lastly, of course, we'd ideally also be able to measure off diagonal strings, which fortunately we can do by doing a particular kind of uh, basis rotation with a quenched blockade radius. We can also measure the off diagonal string operators and we see similar results that even though um, this plot here shows that we have strong dimer resonances, so it's not a classical dimer liquid, still measuring this FM order parameter, it has a very small value. So I did not really have time to discuss subtleties of the von der Waals interaction um, or, or how this stuff could be used for potentially creating topological qubits. It simply not, doesn't fit in a 15 minute talk. But the main takeaway message is quite simple. Using Rydberg blockade physics and the PXP term, you can actually get deconfinement, which could even be probed using this order parameter. So lastly, I just want to thank uh, all my wonderful collaborators. So uh, Misha and Ashwin were involved in, in both projects and then in the experimental uh, realization, there was a lot of people involved. And I just want to quickly want to highlight Julia, who really spearheaded the experimental project. And also discussions with Hannes Spiegler were, were very instrumental in figuring out what the experimental data was actually telling us. Thank you all for your attention. Okay.